I, I just said this on my last video, but I've recorded for quite a few hours today and none of my recordings have stuck. So <laughs> I'm um, losing my voice and I've been talking at my computer for hours now and I'm hoping that this one's going to stick and upload and you guys can watch it on YouTube. But anyways, so we're going to continue off of last week talking about, um, as my thing is beeping at me, talking, continuing about assessments. And, um, you know, we know that time is muscle. I kind of laughed last lecture telling you that when someone has angina and they're symptomatic, the more minutes that they are symptomatic, the um, more problems that uh, are going to be persisting and the more um, cell damage is going to be done. And, you know, time is muscle and you don't want to bring someone in their car. In your car, you want to call the ambulance. Uh, I say that because in the back of a SWAT, squad car, lots of things can happen. Um, lots of good things can happen. So one of the big things is these cardiac markers. So cardiac markers, these are enzymes, cardiac enzymes, or pro, you know, these as proteins that leak out of an injured myocardial cell. So the more angina, those cells are being injured. These, the protein kind of leaks out and it damages into the cell membrane. It ends up in the bloodstream. And then among blood draw, they are looking at cardiac troponin levels. Um, which are released about four to six hours after a heart attack or after an MI and can stay elevated for up to two weeks. So um, why I'm telling you all of this is it's really important that we get help immediately and the blood work, they can tell time, right? So those, the more elevated those enzymes are, the doctor is able to tell how long you've ha been symptomatic and it changes what type of treatment options someone can have. And that's the important thing that not everyone understands that elevated troponin levels with chest pain accurately predict the likelihood of having a full-blown full -blown heart attack and the probability of having some of the, the big clot-busting medi medication that exists. So the diagnosis of an MI is going to require two to three different components, obviously medical history, an EKG, cardiac enzymes, Many, many layers are going to have to happen before they actually diagnose that MI or rule out the MI. When there's damage to the heart does occur, the levels of cardiac matter um, is really what they're looking at over 24-hour periods. So they can get a better feel for how big the MI was, how much necrosis happened, how much cell death. So um, again, it's one of the layers in diagnosing an MI. It's why we want to get help fast. We want to get the blood work done. We want to Try to save as much muscle as we can. Um, so the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, states it always should be least costly and um, up. So we're not going to just jump everyone into the into the cath lab. So screening for coronary artery disease. This is your assignment for this week. Is something called the Framingham. The Framingham is another way of scoring, taking a look at your risk factors. So. Um, looking at the evaluation of chest discomfort, um, low risk, treatment modifications, and immediate risk would be someone who would need to have a graded exercise stress test. Um, a high risk would end up having to have a cardiac cath. Right, so kind of that, the staging, the stepping based on risk and based on um, cost as well, right? We don't just want to send people um, into um, the most expensive so you're going to go to this website, and I want you to get a little familiar with what is the Framingham Heart Study. I want you to do it on yourself. Um, this, kind of in a nutshell, was a has been a long-term study in Framingham, Massachusetts. The residents that live in this town began in 1948 with just over 5,000 adult subjects, and it's now in its third generation of participants. It has been funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood um, Institute in collaboration with Boston University, and it is fabulous information, fabulous data. This are all the components of the framing. These are all the questions it's going to ask you, and you're going to be able to answer them. Um, you might not be able to answer all of them if you haven't had all of the stuff done, but I want you to just, you know, if you don't know the answer, just make up what you think it would be. But this is the, um, again, Framingham is a series of questions that's going to estimate your risk for coronary heart disease. Right, so using the Framingham, it's going to, um, this equation is going to look at high density lipoproteins, the HDL, um, blood pressure, 
um, and it's going to add some points together, and it's going to look at your 10-year risk average. So that's your homework, right? Your homework is, let me go back, it's to go onto the Framingham website. I want you to go ahead and do the formula, and you're going to answer the questions that I have on, on uh, the assignment. When we think about chest pain, we, um, a lot of times chest pain can be cardiac, it can be GI, pulmonary, muscular, skeletal, or trauma. Um, it's, again, as an exercise physiologist, our biggest thing is if someone becomes symptomatic during exercise, we want to know when it is within um, the contraindication to stop exercising and seek some help. Um, many times it might just be yourself that you say, oh, gosh, I'm getting some like chest pain, and then you realize, oh yeah, I lifted yesterday. It's those little intercostals, um, you know, in my chest wall that are inflamed versus angina which is heart, right? And then, so we're most concerned with the angina, but there's other types of cardiac sensations that can happen as well. So what we know about diagnostic testing is that the exercise stress test, which is something that I teach a lot of in all my classes, is how do you run a treadmill stress test? And in some places it might be a bike stress test. But a stress test, which we call the exercise test, has a very strong relationship between cardiovascular and all-cause mortality and work capacity, right? We, in exercise, we use estimated METs, M-E-T-S, right, metabolic equivalent. There's something called the Duke treadmill score. So if you've had one of my other classes, you might be familiar with the Duke treadmill score. Otherwise, I will share it with you, right? The Duke is another estimated kind of prognostic tool to look at your risk for mortality. So you take the data at the end of an exercise test, how many minutes, what workload, heart rate, what their symptoms were you to get gather all the data you got from the stress test, and the Duke score is going to give you a probability, a prognostic value for their five-year survival risk. So um, it's, you know, as college students, we just kind of laugh because your survival rate is very high because, you know, we're young, young and healthy, but um, that's a Duke treadmill. The other big thing about prognostic value is recovery heart rate. So we drive them up during the exercise and then we cool them down in recovery. So we drive them up and then bring them down. How fast your heart rate responds back to baseline is absolute key information for understanding the prognostic value. You guys understand that? Recovery heart rate tells us a lot. We're hoping that heart rate is going to recover quickly. Measured VO2 is the single best predictor of um, survival right? among all. So if we are able to um, actually measure their VO2, that's going to be great. And then guiding measurement, the most common application is to um, always, during a stress test, we are trying to evaluate what we call the ischemic threshold. Ischemic. Ischemic means someone is not getting adequate blood flow, their circulation, their ability for the muscles to be getting adequate oxygen. When someone begins to get ischemic, they start feeling tired, shortness of breath, labored breathing, maybe angina. So at minimum with a stress test, we want to understand if they're going to be ischemic at what minute, what, what workload, at what met level. We call that the threshold. Once we find the ischemic threshold, we now are going to be exercising them below that level. So when you talk about why do we, why do we stress test so many people and why is it such a big deal as an exercise physiologist to understand how to stress test, because it has a lot of great value, ideally the prognostic value it has. The accuracy of diagnostic testing. So this is something you may have gotten in other classes as well. Very common language we use for any type of medical test, athletic training, physical therapy, you know, medicine. Positive versus negative, a positive test means it evaluated that there's an abnormal, right? A negative test, it did not find it. Any clinical test, even if it was considered the gold, gold standard of all tests, will not always correctly identify whether a person has or does not have, right? So you could do a stress test and it might not uncover anything, right? So this, then we move into the words called false positive and false negative. The false positive is a positive test result, but the patient is later to fail with no abnormality. So at a stress test, we say, oh, you had a positive test, but then they go in and dig deeper and they can't find any real heart disease. A false negative is when someone does the test, it's negative, it doesn't look like they have any disease, but later they find out they did have disease. This is one that makes family members really unhappy. You know, what do you mean? My father had a heart attack, he just passed a stress test. Well, 
that would be a false negative. That the test, yes, he may have passed it, but the test failed to reveal that. And then true positive and true negative tests accurately assess the patient's positive or negative for the abnormality. So you kind of silly and wordy, but you probably understand that. Sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is how often the test is going to actually cover the abnormality or disease in a population with the abnormality, right, of the disease of sensitivity. Specificity is how often the test is negative in a normal population with that. We call it specificity. So success of any diagnostic test depends on the technical performance, how well the patient does, the appropriateness of the test, do we order the right test for them, and that also you, us, the interpretation, clinical judgment of the person running the test um, and interpreting the test. So we're going to run it, and we're also it's going to be interpreted as well, the stress test by us and the physician. But all of the accuracy and diagnostic ability comes in the instructions you give the patient, how much effort they put forth in the test. Accuracy and diagnostic test predictive value um, is the ability of the test to obviously accurately determine the presence or absence of the abnormal, the disease or the problem in a single person relies on what we call sensitivity from the last slide and specificity. Positive predictive value is a probability of the disease being present in a person with a positive test. And then the opposite negative predictive value is a probability of um, the disease being absent. So it's really important for proper population we think about population health and all the research we do and understanding why we do what we do, right? we call it evidence-based practice, techniques and interpretation can be applied to any uh, clinical test to enhance the predictive value. So um, we want to really look at what is being done in the literature to make sure we stay up to date on all of this. This is a really interesting table, right? So my test that I'm talking about in all my classes is the standard exercise test. All of these other tests are important tests that you should just know exists. Each test, aside from the treadmill stress test, has um, a little bit more complexity to it, a little bit more medical kind of backing to it. So studies, this is how many studies have been done on this type of test, how many patients they've studied, sensitivity, specificity, and its accuracy. So as you see, the treadmill stress test has had the most amount of studies, and it's predictive Accuracy is about 73%. Coursey, um, coronary calcium scoring is a really interesting test, um, something that doctors would do to predict. And you see it's 65% um, accuracy, So, but it's more costly. So when you take a look at the accuracy and you look at the cost and you look at how many studies have been, have been done on the test for sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, we realize that the old-fashioned getting someone to exercise on a treadmill is still a very important and going to routinely be used test. Right? We can't send everyone into the coronary cavity. We can't send everyone to go get a debutamine, you know, echocardiogram. I mean, all of these give us good images, but they're costly and, um, again, um, not always warranted. We can get a lot of good information, again, just exercising on get, doing a treadmill stress test. So. How to decide which test is being done um, is an important question that patients ask all the time. Of course, we are not deciding, we're just doing the test. But it is, physicians are basing this decision on lots of pre-test decision making. So likelihood that a patient has heart disease, does the, does the doctor think the patient can adequately exercise? We call it symptom limited. So the the doctor is going to say, well, do we think old man George can exercise on the treadmill until he becomes symptomatic? Or do we think George is so out of shape and so deconditioned that within a couple of minutes of walking, he's going to have to get off the treadmill anyways? You understand? So we want to really only stress test someone that we believe that they're going to really be able to give it some effort that we're going to be able to really see the values we're looking for. Will the EKG be interpretable at peak exercise for possible ischemia? So this could depend on you know, body type, um, their balance, their walking, all of these things. Because otherwise, if, we, if it's awkward, um, and then we're getting what we call artifact in the EKG, it can be what we call uninterpretable, and now we don't even, in the EKG, we can't even see the ischemia. These are questions the doctor makes in deciding, do we do a treadmill stress test, or do we send them off to one of the other fancier tests? 
fancier meaning more expensive, really. Um, okay, screening, diagnostic, prognostic, and management. You can use a treadmill stress test for all of these. So the clinical workup, kind of filling in the gap, is um, what is recommended by guidelines, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, what is commonly practiced within the medical community, although guidelines recommend that patients with chest discomfort and a normal resting EKG who are able to ambulate, meaning ambulate walk, should be scheduled for a stress test with EKG monitoring. Simple, that's what they should do. In clinical practice, many physicians are faced with a scenario that they may want to add an imaging. They want it to maybe a stress echo. So, um, although the strategy provides a little bit of improvement in predictive accuracy over stress tests, with the Duke treadmill score, like I mentioned, it also adds a lot of cost. So, if all we do is a treadmill and use the Duke score, because the Duke score is free, right? But so many physicians want an extra level of imaging, which would be like an echo. Um, it does add a lot of cost. This is not a flow chart we would use. I just have this in here, and it's in the notes for you to look at. This is what we call a diagnostic decision tree that physicians make. And I only am sharing this with you simply because patients will say, well, I don't understand. Well, I have to exercise. You know, my sister Sue didn't have to exercise on the treadmill. I don't want to exercise on the treadmill. So this decision tree is helps patients to realize that the doctors are not just randomly picking these tests. They are following a list of, do you have heart disease? Yes, no. What are your symptoms? Yes, no. You know, can you amputate? Yes, no. And what are they trying to uncover at deciding with heart, with heart disease what is the best test to be using? And again, most all the time, the doctor is going to start with the treadmill stress test. Imaging is a really nice tool, right? Doing the ultrasound, the echocardiogram, is a really nice tool to be done. So imaging study provides slightly higher sensitivity and specificity than just doing the exercise alone. Um, imaging are done with those that are... If you do the EKG and they can't quite interpret it, we call it uninterpretable. Um, or they're unable to exercise at a high level of exercise. They're not able to put that kind of load of stress on their heart. Then we'll do a, um, an echocardiogram. So it's a good test and it's going to produce some good information. So this is candidates for an exercise um, EKG. So this would be regular stress testing without imaging. The one column has appropriate meaning someone can exercise, get their heart rate up, they have no right, they do not have any EKG problem, which would be a right bundle branch block. Um, you know, we've done the Framingham heart study and the risk is, um, you know, screening, looking at the risk of Framingham, um, looking at their gender, their symptoms, um, you know, kind of going through this list of questions versus inappropriate people based on their EKGs, based on what known risk factors they have, based on other known information, they would say, no, we're not going to do the treadmill stress test. And move on to the echo, right? So the echo is that ultrasound of the heart. So cardiac ultrasound um, is just how ultrasound works. It's going to use sound waves. And ultrasound is going to allow viewing of the actual chamber, the size of the um, atrium and the ventricle and the blood. Um, at Exercise echo, and I may have mentioned this in this class, but an exercise echo, this one here, is a really common test to be used. This is like my fifth lecture. I'm running out of energy. So the exercise echo is, you do the echo, and then we stress them on the treadmill, and instead of letting them recover on the treadmill, we throw them on the table, lie them supine, and do another echo, because now their heart's beating really fast in their chest, and we're going to get a nice ultrasound well it's um, at you know elevated heart rate so they can look at the normal they can look at the wall motion at rest and then at peak exercise to see if there's any type of discomfort if someone cannot exercise then they're going to do what we call a pharmacological stress test that's the last one called a dibutamine stress test so instead of now they're going to um, inject dibutamine and that's going to force the heart to kind of pretend that it's exercising. I mean, it, it's going to stress the heart without them actually having to exercise. Um, and it's going to do what we call positive chrono, um, chronotrophic. It's going to increase heart rate, increase contractility, onotrophic. So it's, this medicine is going to make the heart beat faster while they do the debutamine, unlike the 
go up above it where we have them on the treadmill making them exercise. So I'm giving you this information. I mean, I want you to be able to feel comfortable with stress testing. I feel like most students don't feel comfortable until you go out to do an internship with stress testing. If we do it together in the lab, you're still not comfortable until you watch others and you really see a kind of an awkward patient with balance kind of going through one. So I want you as you sit through this lecture to understand that um, we have all these different testings that are going to be available for someone in cardiac rehab. The rest mild cardiac perfusion is a radioactive isotope that's injected. So a nurse would inject them and then we would run the treadmill and stress them. And then at the end, we're looking at how well that isotope was um, uptake throughout the heart. So in areas of decreased perfusion, so it didn't uptake it, there's a delay in uptake. Um, it didn't wash out, so up, wash out. The presence of perfusion is not present. And what does that indicate? If it doesn't uptake, we have ischemia, right? This is disease. Ischemia is what you know as, you know, lack of blood flow. So this is myocardial perfusion imaging. Again, we use the treadmill, but they're um, injected with radioactive isotope. And then we've got candidates for who would have a, commonly known as a stress, uh, nuclear stress test. The PED is progesterone emission tomography test, PET scanning. PET scanning is very accurate um, for non-invasively identifying how severe someone's heart disease is. Non-invasive, typically um, save for patients with um, equivocal radionuclide scans, so we don't do it on all of them, it's expensive, but uh, again, the viability um, with determining if revascularization would be beneficial, meaning do they need to go in and do an open heart surgery or put a balloon or a stent in there. And then MRI, cardiac MRI is to evaluate kind of the structural damage of the heart, someone that has enlargement, cardiomyopathy. Um, this comes from long-standing ischemic heart disease, lack of blood flow. So it's looking at the size. Um, anyone who has a or the top, the big aorta, the aortic dissection. So anyways, the, the cardiac MRI is another imaging technique that can be used um, when you're looking at pharmacological stress testing, dibutamine I mentioned, adenosine, all of these different ways that they can evaluate, um, you know, the, the assess what's going on. The CTA is a coronary um, computed tomography. It's what we call the calcium score, right? I mentioned that earlier. So it's the evaluation of how much cori um, coronary calcium is present. So we know that everyone's going to calcify, all humans are going to end up having some calcification. And this is going to give us imaging that is kind of similar to kind of an angiogram. So studies have shown that CTAs can really give you really, really good data um, with patients who have acute chest discomfort with um, calcium scoring. So it's, again, looking at the severity of the disease. Um, again, it's helpful when someone, we can't do an EKG on them, we can't interpret the EKG very well. The, um, the calcium scoring can be really beneficial. And then the one we've already talked about a lot is kind of that very last thing is we wheel someone into the coronary catheterization lab. Coronary angiogram is going to use a cardiac catheterization technique. Um, and it's going to go right up in there and take a look at the angiogram, take a look at the imaging, go right in, release the dye, and watch under ultrasound, under the x-ray, um, to see if there's any lesions. And I've showed you lots of photos in previous um, lectures. So if a coronary stenosis is greater than 70%, usually that's what's going to be triggering the ischemia. Lesions that are less than 70%, oftentimes they don't mess with them. They're kind of borderline with they're going to go in and they're clinically, are they, meaning are they clinically significant? Are they going to go in and do a revascularization, a balloon, a stent, an open heart? So lesions, um, they're, you know, less than 50%, they're usually just going to pile up and be and do their own thing. So the coronary cath lab is, you know, obviously very beneficial. The intravascular ultrasound is another great way of, you know, what they're gonna do in the cath lab is to go all the way in there and visualize the lumen, the size of the lumen, the calcification. They can decide what size stent they're gonna to use to go in there. We're not doing any of that. In this class, I need you to focus on exercise. I want you to focus on the importance of doing a stress test, the prognostic value you get from it, 
And for this week, I want you to learn all about the framing ham. I want you to realize how incredible the study is. I want you to do the framing ham um, calculation on yourself. And you're going to give me a minimum word count of it to make sure you're all writing enough. So describe your results, describe Framingham, all the instructions are up there on uh, Brightspace. So pretty basic, so kind of just continuing on before we get into some more good new stuff with Cody Everybody.